it should be up there. Did you see it? Or are you just straightening it up? Now, when I go walk over and find it, so when it's right on top, directly. It says six. Oh. Or do you want the table cover? Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> I wasn't going to do it. Let's witness it. So don't be <laughs> All right, so let's get back to SS. Oh, what a same way. So we have an essay test coming up, AKA next week. What? Next week is essay week. By the way, December, limbo month. Okay, moving on. Get limber, people. Huh? Next month is, is essay month. Every day, there'll be no more learning. Just that's it. Oh. Now, these are a lot of this you've already had in other classes. I understand that, but there are certain things you need for my class and also the, the AP exam. And you know, that's going to be part of life. All of you know you have to adapt to the class whoever is assessing you, so to speak. You just have to adapt. That's the way life is. So these are the essay tips. I know most of them are intuitive. It's not that big of a deal. If you look on one side of the tips, and I'll talk about this more as we get to it, but we got to work on thesis statements first. Am I missing one? You're probably going to expect me to give you another one. Okay. Well, I miscounted. It's okay. We'll get you one. Now, if you look at the back side, these are the guidelines, aka rubric for. What the college board does they have a six point scale don't read too much in a rubric the big thing is you know when they're actually grading these unknown forces that grade your essay we do the ap exam they will have this and certain check marks and they literally go through and check off that you've done things now don't read too much into it you, you know certain things you have to have a lot of it's pretty vague the big thing is a good essay you write a good essay they'll give you a good grade on this you write a bad essay this will come out bad so but one thing we need, a thesis statement. A, the thesis statement is one sixth, actually arguably one third of your grade. They really overstate the thesis statement. So we'll do thesis statements all the time. In here. And so tomorrow we are going to do some thesis statements in class. I'll talk about it. We'll do a few just to prep, prep you. There are certain things that I will look for in a thesis statement, not only because I think they're, it's good, it helps you organize, but it's also good for the AP exam. It'll be a little different than what you had before in other classes, I'm sure, but I, hopefully it'll make sense. But the thesis statement is key. That will lay out how you do the essay test. And so you're gonna look at this on your own. Tomorrow we'll talk about thesis statements, but we do five paragraph essays. Not because I particularly like five paragraph essays, but they're timed. And when you have a timed essay, you don't have time to sit there and try to reinvent something or come up with something dramatic or go back and proofread. You've got to get what you know down quick, fast, in a way that the person, this unknown person who's assessing you, can grade it, know what you know, know that you understand the question, et cetera. And so five paragraph essay. The first paragraph, there's two big elements of it, something, um, we call it context, we'll get to it, but then the thesis statement. That's in the introduction. I'll tell you more about that. The next three are your body paragraphs. Each body paragraph, in essence, is exactly the same as a short ID. You just put it in the context of answering your question. You just need a topic sentence. You notice on the short IDs, I have no topic sentence. You have a topic sentence. If you can get one more example, that's great. But if you have that basic element of a short ID, you've done a good body paragraph. And then a closing, which I'll talk about, but that's the least important paragraph in the time test. So we will talk about this. And I'll go through my silly little formula. And I do that more anything else just so it's easy for me to get down and show you. We'll do thesis statements. It's just something we got to do. But if you write a good thesis statement, where you lay out how you're going to answer that question, address the prompt, so to speak. 
you're telling the person grading it, I know what I'm talking about, and this is how I'm going to do it. That is so huge. And you're also telling yourself how you're going to do it. Because trust me, I've been doing this a long time. I get a lot of essays where I can tell the person writing it has no idea what they're doing. All they know is words. I must put words on paper. Who's written an essay where you know and I've got to get stuff down? Every one of you don't lie. You've all done it. And there's something else you have to organize because what's the first thing you think of? What's the first thing you're thinking once you start writing an essay? <laughs> <laughs> that sums it up. You're thinking about doing one thing, and what's that? Finish it, right? And when you start getting tired, it becomes easy to miss. It's to miss something. All of us have done that. So organize and the basic statement of it. So please look at this on your own. We'll talk about these statements tomorrow after the quiz. And let us begin. So we, did we get to this? Did we? I thought we did. Yeah, yeah this is talking about neutrality rights. Remember that's remember the whole thing about entrustment, Macon's Bill Number Two, uh, Non-Intercourse Act, all those things. And then what was the battle along the frontier in Indiana, where the where Tecumseh's Confederation was destroyed? What did America about said? <laughs> Let's just say. I was about to say, what did citizens of the U.S. start calling themselves? And I'm about to say, what was American? Remember, the citizens of the United States started calling themselves Americans. And we wanted Canada. But Federalists were opposed, and they're the ones most affected by stopping ships. So the biggest reason for the war was to destroy the remnants of the American Indian threat to the expansion of the United States and get Canada. Kind of worked. Disaster. <laughs> Speaking of disaster, let's get to it. Mr. Madison's war. He reluctantly supported this war, but by supporting it, it became his war. And the Federalists were opposed. The Northeast was against this. Federalist New England even talked secession. And so the country was still bitterly divided. Don't forget, it was still unclear what states could do, what the federal government could do, federalism. That had not been decided and would not be for another 50 years. Also, don't write down the numbers. Just say the military unprepared. And I put these numbers to give you an idea how small the U.S. Army was. Only 6,700 kind of trained troops. Eventually, militia would come up at about 35,000 total. But even then, all, not all the militia, but just so the military is unprepared. The U.S. only had 16 ships in the Navy, but only seven could sail. The U.S. had no ships of the line, the bigger battleships. The British had over 200 ships of the line. I mean, it's no way that the U.S. Navy could match it. There's going to be some one-on-one -on -one battles where U.S. would make very good frigates, would win individual battles, but no chance. And then the charter for the bank, the 20-year charter from back from 1792 expired. The money supply crashed, the economy crashed, just when we need to do things like buy lots of food for soldiers and uniforms and gunpowder. The United States was totally unprepared and it became a very unpopular war. Why did I do that? But I should add, Madison did win re-election. So during the war, there was a re-election. But look at the Northeast. Those states in orange, those are the Federalist states. And they, a lot of those states voted for Madison in 1808. They voted, uh, Stuart Clinton was governor of New York. So the Federalist Party is stronger. There's a lot of anti-war sentiment here, especially when fighting the British Army. But the thing about it is that the British, not a huge army, powerful Navy, but they're occupied with the French. So there's a window. So the plan was invade Canada with the assumption that all the Canadians would rush and join the United States and the United States would take over this entire continent. That was kind of at least the northern part of the continent. And the traditional avenues of invasion would follow Lake Champlain up towards Montreal. 
uh, Niagara near present-day Buffalo, New York. York is the capital of the colony of Canada. Today it's called Toronto. You might have heard of it. And then Detroit, the three avenues. How did it go for the United States Army? Disaster, unmitigated disaster, catastrophic disaster. Each place, horrific failures. At Niagara, the tiny U.S. Army was routed as the New York militia watched from a hillside. Their governor would not release them to fight in the battle. That should give you an idea how poorly prepared the United States was. At Detroit, General Isaac Call Hall was a, uh, a Revolutionary War general. He, by then, he was a kind of a fossil, but he commanded over 3,000 troops, a very powerful fort in Detroit. It was a stone fort, ramparts, well protected. Facing him were less than half that number of British forces and the remnants of Tecumseh's Confederacy. Yet Hall would surrender without firing a shot. He advanced into Canada, saw the British forces, ran away, went inside Fort Detroit, where he could have held up in this powerful fort. The British didn't have enough men to take it or surround it and hold and lay siege. But what the British did was one of the great rouges, and this has been done before. So think about nearly a mile away from the fort, there's kind of a clearing, and then there's a forested area. There's kind of a tree, a couple of clearings between the trees. So nearly a mile away, the British forces, Paul has over 3,000, the British have about 1,400 British and Tecumseh's men. They marched out of the clearing, the British forces first, across or out of the forest, into the clearing. And so Paul could see him from Detroit, see him from the fort. They marched through this forest and then back into the trees, followed by Tecumseh's men. So they could see all the British and the Confederate for Confederacy forces. When they got to the trees, what did the British forces do when they first got into the trees and out of sight from Detroit? They sprinted around and went through again. And they did that four times. Paul thought he was outnumbered and surrendered without firing a shot. Things aren't going well. This was a disaster. So as you can tell from this easy to follow West Point map, Okay, I'm comforted by this map. I can sleep well at night knowing this map is here. Why? There's arrows, lines with arrows. Don't you feel better now? Don't you? A little bit, a little bit? So, for example, the frigate, the Constitution, did win two battles against single British ships, and so many cannonballs bounced off its oaken sides that it's going to be called Ironside, soon all Ironside. And so that, that would be one victory, but still not against the, the entire British fleet. The only reason I mentioned the Constitution is it is still in the United States Navy today. The ship that was built in the 1790s. So if you go to Boston, you can visit the Constitution. You get a tour of it, and your tour guide is a chief petty officer, which is like a sergeant major in the U.S. Navy. And they take you through it as a U.S. Navy crew. It is still a, a, a U.S. Navy ship on active duty to this day, the Constitution. And so, for example, when the United States invaded Iraq in 2003, the Constitution shelled the shores of Iraq. And so that shows that it's still a United States naval vessel to this day for the 1790s. And so that's what, no, it did not. No, we did not have a ship from the 1790s with black powder can. And Iraq has no shore. It doesn't have a beach. By the way, isn't it amazing how easy it would be to fool people? A lot of people think, well, I guess maybe they did it for show, or I don't know, sure, I don't know, maybe. There's not even a shore of Iraq. Iraq is not on the ocean. So, that is why be very wary sometimes. That's be skeptical of things. Moving on. The Battle of Lake Erie, you don't need to write this down, but Oliver Hazard Perry, would, he was a Commodore, meaning a temporary commander of a small scratch fleet on Lake Erie right here, defeated a small British fleet at the Battle of Put-in-Bay. 
or the Battle of Lake Erie. Uh, we're not worried about don't give up the ship, but they defeated this small British fleet. They sent back word to Washington, D.C. We have met the enemy and they are ours. And the reason I'm telling you this is like the U.S. could claim a couple victories. See, we won somewhere. Actually, Harry, this was a big victory. The Battle of Lake Erie. A raiding mission from Detroit, now under a competent general, William Henry Harrison, the same one who was at Tippy Canoe, would win the Battle of the Thames right about here. They also burnt down the capital at York, the British colonial capital on the way. So this was a few victories. Tecumseh and his Confederacy, this would be their last battle. The last battle after Tippy Canoe. The British abandoned the battlefield and Tecumseh stayed. They fought bravely, but they were overwhelmed, outnumbered three to one. And this is the battle where Tecumseh was killed. Now, this is supposedly, there are many of these lithographs in the 1840s and 1850s of the death of Tecumseh. They never did find his body. And a lot of people would try to take credit for, for killing Tecumseh in this battle. But that's what Tecumseh was about. And so after the battle, as the Confederate, the the remaining Shawnees and Miami, you know, they're running away. Harris's men went looking for the body and they tried to find Tecumseh. To this day, like I said, no one found it, but they, somebody found a body. And to give you an idea how, as the United States became conquerors of the continent and started calling themselves Americans, the contempt they would start to show for the people who lived here, the people who were the Americans too, before that especially, they found a body. And someone said, I found it comes with fire. It's just this poor unfortunate, probably a Shawnee who was killed. And they skinned him. They skinned his back and tanned the leather. So, you know, human skin's thick. And they tanned the leather. Now, not as thick as, let's say, cattle, but still thick. And they took it and cut to the back and cut thin strips of it and sold it. And soon there's going to be thousands. So clearly... Probably not human to other animals. I said these were Tecumseh leather straps to show you the contempt they had for people. You know, these are not human beings that they were terrified of Tecumseh and also, yes, we conquered you. And, that and all over this region, it became a big deal for a certain type of business to have a Tecumseh leather strap. They would advertise this. So think about a thin leather strap about this long, about that thick, thin. So you couldn't use it for a lot of things, but. It's for something. Anyone know what you'd use? Yeah. Slave trade. Yeah, that's actually a good idea, but it'd be too thin. You ever seen an old barber shop where they have a single blade razor and you get that fine edge on a single blade? Be some leather. Have you ever seen that? At a barber shop. So well into the 20th century, they would still advertise this for them. But also give you an idea now how, how attitudes are changing. Remember, American East represented liberty. Tecumseh was just considered, considered him with great respect and fear. And then they did that. So 1814, the British decided to knock the Americans out, the United States out. Not destroy and take the country, but humiliate them. And who knows? Who knows what might happen? The French have been defeated in 1814. So now the British forces, angry now that they thought, we're home. Nope, you still got to fight one more war. They will knock them out with a full blockade this time. So Napoleon is just being defeated. He's just being sent to Elba, which is in the Mediterranean. Oh, he'll come back. There's something called Waterloo coming. But they will invade Lake Champlain. You burn down our capital, we'll go to your capital off the Chesapeake. But here's the big Take and maybe even keep New Orleans. The most prosperous port in the United States. That's the plan. And the blockade, I should add, was incredibly effective for the British. It totally isolated an American trade, which was already devastated from embargo, non intercourse act, Megan's Bill number two, and now war. 1814, a horrible year. And the bank shutting down. But at Lake Champlain, a scratch American force defeated a British force. With clever use of anchors and a lot of luck, they held Lake Champlain. So the British attack there failed. Now let's be clear about it. 
the British were kind of open. Remember 1777 in the Battle of Saratoga? They're thinking about the same thing. Maybe isolate this, but they're hoping the Federalists might succeed. Here, that's what they're hoping. Win a battle here, the Federalists will say we're done with it, and they break out of the United States. And that almost happened. But fortunately for the United States, they won here. Now, the Chesapeake, August and September of 1814. The powerful Royal Navy is going to sail up the Chesapeake. They're going to do a feint. The Navy will uh, fake an attack up the Potomac, but then Army under General Ross, these were crack British troops. They had been fighting in the peninsula. Oh, and they were not happy. Uh, it's called the Peninsula Campaign in Spain, in the Napoleonic War. They're going to advance overland attack Washington, D.C. this way. Remember, D.C., they literally, you know, the town was just started. President Adams was the first president to, live, to move into the half-finished executive mansion in 1800. And this was a raid to humiliate the United States. Now, the U.S. was starting to get trained forces. They actually were performing better here and here, but there's no roads. There's no way to get their trained men from here to here. So all they have are about 6,000 untrained militia. What do militia always do? But this time, at the Battle of Bladensburg, they think they have a chance. There's a stone fence, and they thought with the men behind this stone wall, it's like a fort. They'll hold out and fight. The Americans know the British are just going to try to attack real fast, and they can hold out for a day or two, the British will retreat. And so Madison, the Secretary of the Treasury, Gallatin, Secretary of State Monroe, they all went to watch the battle at Bladensburg. Now, I can tell you what happened, but I thought this easy to follow map would explain it pretty well. And I'm comforted by it because look at all the arrows. Okay. <laughs> there was a stone wall right here. And the plan was pulled out the stone wall. So the militia would hunker down, be somewhat protected up to here, so feel relatively safe. Remember the Battle of Bunker Hill? They made that little quick hasty defense and they kind of stayed. That was the plan. The British plan, Ross knew we had to go. And so their plan was, they've done this before, march 50 paces away, fire, fix bayonets, charge. That was it. That was the British plan. Not a lot of finesse here. And so the British got to 50 paces. Remember, President Madison's on the hill. He's actually right about here watching this. Got to 50 paces. The British fired, loaded, fired again. And the colonial militia behind their fence popped up. Not the colonial, sorry, the U.S. militia. Took very careful aim and did what? Ran. They all ran. The whole line just took off running. They ran so fast, they called it the Bladensburg Races. The British couldn't catch them. They ran through the Capitol and just dispersed. Madison had barely enough time to get back to the executive mansion, grab a few papers, and get his family out of there. If you go there today, Washington, D.C., there's a plaque, and it says this is where President Madison watched the British take the executive mansion. There's another plaque near the Capitol. This is where President Madison watched British forces enter the U.S. Capitol. I mean, boom, gone. An absolute humiliation. The British stormed in, and they proceeded to break everything they could find. You can imagine, let's just go take stuff. And they stormed into the executive mansion. There were a few men who tried to hold out before they ran away. If you go to the White House today, in the front columns, there are still bolt musket balls in those columns to this day. So if you take a tour and walk out that front door, you know, tour for 20 years. I don't know if they still walk out the front door. But if you do, you can see a couple of musket balls still in the columns to this day from 1814. So they went through, looted everything they could take, everything the British soldiers couldn't take, they broke, and then burned it down. Then they went to the Capitol, and they started, basically, it's just the same thing. Just break everything. If it looks valuable, take it. They really wanted rugs. So you see a lot of guys taking rugs here. And they're just stealing everything. And so this chaotic team in the Capitals are taking their axes, their bayonets, they're scraping stuff. You just imagine how much fun it would be if you're told, hey, go break it. Yeah, and they all go in. In the United States House of Representatives chambers, 
which wasn't very big. Remember, the country was small then. The men are breaking stuff and you know, shooting their muskets in the air. And General Ross, their commander, realized, we got to get going. So he started beating his pistol on the podium of the secretary of the, of the Speaker of the House. So the U.S. Speaker of the House. Start beating it. And no one listened to him. They're, just, they're breaking stuff. All these British soldiers. So he fires his pistol in the air. And I'll stop and look at him. And he said, man, this is a parliament. So we'll have a vote. Shall we burn it? Ah! And so they burn the Capitol. If you go there today and take a tour of the U.S. Capitol, in the foundations of the Capitol, the scorch marks are not burning. They built the U.S. Capitol on the, literally on the foundation of the original. And so that was completely destroyed. The executive mansion, the inside was completely burnt out, but the shell remained. So by the end of the 1820s, they rebuilt the inside. But with all the scorch marks, they take this building that was more tan and turn it, they covered it with whitewash to cover up the scorch marks. Thus, it would start to be called. No way, yes. And if you go there today, not the same thing they built. After World War II, they did the same, or they did this. They burnt down the, no. They gutted the inside, totally removed all the inside. They just left the shell and rebuilt the White House. So if you know the executive, uh, the president's office, you've heard of the Oval Office, that would be built in 48, 49, when they did it. And president Truman spent half of his presidency, he lived in Blair House because of there was no White House. So with that, then they're gonna go up to Baltimore. And so the British left, took all their loot, went on board ships, and, Here's Baltimore. Here's uh, a little peninsula. It's Fort McHenry, an unfinished fort right here. And the British plan was, it's relatively narrow, so they had these gunboats, not their big, bigger ships, are going to sail out to fire mortars or, or rockets. Subdue this fort. It's called reduce it. So this fort surrenders. But then the big plan was to attack overland and attack this. That was the plan. But they had to knock out that fort, Fort McHenry. And so about a month afterwards, when they evacuated Washington, D.C., almost exactly a month after, the night of the 13th to 14th, the plan was to shell Fort McHenry till it surrenders. Fort McHenry was unfinished. This is what it's going to look like when it would be finally finished before the Civil War. A star fort, thick ramparts, then the ramparts were just mounds of dirt. The fort was basically just a big brick building then. It's a much more, if you go there today, the force not quite what it was because they did a lot of improvement on it. And the ships, do you know what a mortar is? Yeah. Yeah, and I figure the walls would be thick, but it hit on the weaker roof. Now mortars are light weapons, but then they were big cannons. And fire this way. They also had rockets. And they were using, um, do you know what a bottle rocket is? You can't bottle rocket, like a little stick, a little, have you seen a bottle rocket? No? I shouldn't fire a bottle rocket. Don't fire bottle rockets at people. Somebody said, yeah, last, uh, was it last, um, last year someone, oh yeah, I don't know what a bottle rocket is, I got hit in the eye with one. So, bottle rockets are dangerous. Imagine a stick, they, and bottle rocket's about this long, little, a um, little bit of black powder, you fire them, they kind of whiz off again. They're almost the same thing, I'll take a log, and they put a barrel of gunpowder in a fuse, and they just kind of go up in the air. They might hit something, like the ground, but they would fire these more than anything else because they were scary. So they caught the, oh, and one more thing, the mortars would fire a cannonball, and they haul the cannonball out and put black powder in it. So when it fired, there'd be a fuse, and the fuse would catch fire. And so the fuse would burn and hopefully go off when it hit the fort. So you could see it in the air, or these rockets in the air. Good sound effects, huh? So these are the rocket ships. Now there's this guy, you might have heard of him, named Francis Scott Key. Francis Scott Key was a lawyer. He, he went out to the ship. I always forget 
his friend's name. I just, for some reason, I can't remember William Beans was a doctor who went out to, or Bennett, I'm sorry. And, but it looked like Beans, and for some reason that messes me up, but Bennett was his doctor. He went out to go. He had been, he'd been captured by the British after the, uh, after the um, attack on Washington, D.C. He went out to release him, went out to the USS, or the HMS Tonnet, which was a Royal Navy gunboat. You don't need to know those. I put them so I just kept forgetting Venice. It just, it's fun. I just got tied in. So he got there and they said, well, we're not going to worry about now. We're about ready to shell. We're going to hold you on board this ship. And so he was on one of the gunboats that was firing at McHenry. And it must have been spectacular because as the sun went down, you could really see those mortar rounds, the bombs going through and see the fuse. So you could see it. And they moved relatively slow. It's black powder stuff. Or those rockets whizzing off into the air. So that's all he saw at night. And so the last thing he saw of McHenry was the massive flag that McHenry was flying. What the assumption was in the morning, he wouldn't see the flag, he'd see a white flag of surrender as the flag was reduced, or the, the fort was reduced. Because it wasn't finished. And the flag is huge. If you get an idea of it, this is four stories. Look how big he is compared to the flag. It's after the battle, all these people came and cut off pieces of the flag for souvenirs. So like a fifth of the flag is gone. And someone even cut out a star and kept it for a souvenir. And what did he see the next morning after this spectacular attack? He saw the flag, yes, which he called, eventually called the Star Spangled Banner. That would inspire him to write a poem called The Defense of Fort McHenry, and he called the flag the Star Spangled Banner. The Defense of Fort McHenry was a four stanza poem, but he had a song in his head, and every year they reenact this in Baltimore. I, had to, I was actually there, they did some fireworks to get an idea, but... On the 13th and 14th, they have boats come out and they fire to kind of simulate the rockets. McHenry's really pretty. It's a national park. The fort is really well maintained. It's it's kind of beautiful. It's like a shockingly cool place. If you get to Baltimore, you get a soft shell crab and then go there. Okay, so when the first time I saw it, the flags at the Smithsonian Museum of American History, this massive four-story wall, the flag was just hanging there. And you could see it. And next time I was there, they had taken it down and they went thread by thread and redid the flag. And so now the flag is much more brighter, it's much more preserved, and it's much more protected. But that's what it looks like today. And look how much of the flag was cut off. The flag was originally this long, that was all for souvenirs and went to a little piece. Because, of course, people did that. Yeah, that's the way people are. And one more thing. That's the poem. And it's a good fighting poem. But do you notice Twilight's Last Gleaming? All these things relate to that. There's the star, the ramparts, the last bit of the fort, rockets, the bombs. It's all about the fight. And the War of 1812. So it mentions what the British were doing, and it goes on. It's a four stanzas, but people only know this. Should add one more thing. The song he was thinking of was called To Anacreon in Heaven from the Anacreonic Society. And so Dick has a song to it. And this is it. To Anacreon in Heaven, where he fat in full bleeds. The Anacreon Society was a drinking society. And this was a song that was meant to be sung by drunk people around a piano. Has anyone ever tried to sing the national anthem? No, we afraid to sing it well. Hit the high points and low points. We left you for the high It's not easy either. Because it's not meant to be sung well, it's meant to be screamed around a piano by drunk people. And that is the music to the, the national anthem, a drinking song. Because, well, it benefits this, and it's a fighting song. 
Now, there was no national anthem. In 1916, they started adopting this as kind of a national anthem because the other unofficial national anthem was My Country Tis of Thee. But that's the same music as God Save the King. And they didn't want to be confused with the British national anthem. And in 1931, it became the official national anthem. And I like how it has this article here about pacifists object because it is clearly a fighting song. Now, it's not as much as the, the French national anthem, the Marseillaise, which literally has blood flowing in the streets. That's in the song. But 31, and then World War II, they would start doing it at professional games as kind of a show of patriotism. They started playing it before games. And then in the Cold War in the 1950s, that came back. And that's where that comes from. It's part of the Cold War. I should add one more thing. One of the verses is an attack on British policy and in defense of something else. Remember in the Revolutionary War, what were the British doing that really offended plantation owners? No refuge could the could save the hireling and slave from the tear of flight or the gloom of victory. He's talking about the British inciting slavery. The British were recruiting slaves and saying, You will be free, you and your family, if you fight against the British. It's just like what happened in the Revolutionary War. So the, the Star Spangled Banner and the National Anthem is a pro-slavery song, too. One of those strange little quirks in our very complex, but also I think makes it very interesting history, explained a lot of things. We have contradictions all over. By the way, those soldiers were called Americans, and after the war, they would be given homestead in Bahamas and Bermuda. And that's why when people say, they kind of jokingly talk about Americans and say that about the United States. I said, wait a second, those were Americans and those were people who fought for their freedom. Yes. They were on the British side. But the British called them Americans because they were from the United States. And they were slaves who were given their freedom by the British. And they called them Americans. And to this day, this is what a home uh, in this is in the Bahamas, and these are graves of former British soldiers who won their freedom in the War of 1812, are part of our very complex history. I should add, while this is going on, the Hartford Convention, the British blockade was strangling New England. New England Federalists, in secret, 26 of them met in Hartford, Connecticut. And they talked, remember nullification from the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions? They even talked secession, leaving the Union. But the war in, I don't know why I use A, B, and C, I have no idea, but I kept it. But the war ended before anything could come out of this. And by 1850, it made the Federalists look like they were against the country, anti-patriotic. And the Federalists never recovered from this. So this is a Republican cartoon, there's Lady Columbia, and this is the ballot box, implying the Republicans are the party of the people, rights, no bribery and corruption. And here are the Federalists, and they're the Hartford Convention, do anything for money, and the and Beelzebub, the, the devil. And who's the crown represent? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So with that, nobody wanted this stupid war anymore. And so in 1814, it's a British crown party. Actually, December 20, 24, 1814, in Ghent, Belgium. They didn't meet in Paris because Napoleon had just surrendered. They signed a treaty. Ghent, by the way, beautiful town in current Belgium. Belgium actually wasn't a country club yet. And this is one of those status quo any bell. Go back to the way it was before the war. And so the U.S., which by any measure did not win this war, but we didn't lose, right? And therefore we won. The problem is this is 1814. The British invasion fleet of New Orleans, waiting for the end of hurricane season down in Jamaica, in December began sailing up here and there was no way to tell. 
And the biggest battle, the War of 1812, is going to happen two weeks after the war. The Battle of New Orleans. But remember that security law on the frontier. Let me get to this last thing. Let's put it up there. All right, we got, I'm going to get to this. As an excuse of the War of 1812, the Creek and the Choctaw were powerful southern tribes. Remember, Tecumseh went south before the Battle of Tippecanoe. Well, this War of 1812 was used as, as an excuse to destroy them. The powerful Creek nation, but divided. Some didn't want to fight. Uh, it was so they were divide and conquer. And right here in present day Alabama, Andrew Jackson, a very talented lawyer, intelligent man, to say he's con uh, controversial is an understatement, would defeat the Creeks. And here is Red Sticks, the leader surrendering to Jackson, in a horrific battle called Horseshoe Bend. That's a diorama for the battle. After the battle, in this fit of revenge and looting and bloodlust, Jackson's men slaughtered hundreds of Creeks. And he did not, he ordered them to stop. A few of them he would have executed because of this, but he was still a command, so he's responsible. But Horseshoe Bend would wipe out any chance for that. And that's going to lead to the Battle of New Orleans. Last thing we got to get, and then we're done. Sound good? Tomorrow, we'll put the Battle of New Orleans after our quiz and then we'll do thesis statements. And then what are we going to do? Oh, create a new world. To bring tools. What's the new world? Industrial revolution. Everything will be there. Oh, I got your test. Yeah. So I should have the test tomorrow, hopefully. Yeah, class is fine. Oh, no. Class is really fine. Yeah, you guys did well. Almost everybody's passed. No, A's and B's almost all. You're doing really well. All right. I'm a great year. I hope you just got the second period. It doesn't even get me <laughs> A's and B's is, uh, is good. Yeah. A's and B's, I'd say grade is good. Crayon, you haven't seen a bottle rocket. Yeah. I think sell them anymore? I mean, I haven't been to a fireball stand in 